Now we shall begin. You should answer the questions as you listen, because you will not hear the recording a second time. Listen carefully and answer questions one to five. Kingsbury College, can I help you? Oh, hello. I'm ringing to find out about one of your courses. Yes. Is that a daytime or an evening course? Evening. Right. I'll just get a few details from you, if I may. Fine. Could I have your full name first of all? It's Peter Wright. That's W R I G H T. Okay. And I don't need to know your exact age, but can you tell me which of these age groups you belong to? Eighteen to twenty-five, twenty-six to thirty-five, thirty-six to forty-five, or over forty-five. Eighteen to twenty-five. Fine. And do you have a job, or are you a full-time student? I'm an accountant. I just do courses in my spare time for interest. Okay. Right, and your address, Mr. Wright. It's Eleven Forest Road. F O R E S T. Yes. Hmm. Is that in Kingsbury? Yes, it is. I'm just down the road here. And do you have a phone number? It's double nine two four seven one. That's my home number. I haven't got a work number. That's fine. We probably won't need it. Before you hear the rest of the conversation, you have some time to look at questions six to ten. Now listen and answer questions six to ten. Now you want to register for a course. Yes, cookery. Do you happen to know the exact title of the course? We've got Thai cookery on Wednesdays, or Mexican cookery on Fridays, or Mexican. I'd like to do both, but I'm busy on Wednesdays. Okay. Well, you can always do the other one next term, I suppose. Now, do you know when it begins? Is it the twenty-sixth of March? That's right, and it's forty-five pounds in total. That's including the ingredients. How would you like to pay? Card, cash? Can I send a check? You can, yes, as long as it arrives at least one week before the start of the course. Okay. And I'll just give you a reference number. If you could make a note of it and write it on the back. Yes. It's C Z nine four three. Yes, got that. Good. Well, there's just one last question. Do you have any special requirements that I should make a note of? Yes, there is one thing. I use a wheelchair. Right. So you need to have access for that. Okay. Don't worry. Your room is on the ground floor, and I'll make sure there are no steps involved. We can always put a ramp in. Thanks. So we look forward to seeing you on the twenty-sixth of March. That is the end of part one. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now turns to part two. 
Part 2. You are going to hear a conversation between a student and a driving instructor. First, look at questions 11 to 14. Listen carefully. Hello. I'm going to be your driving instructor today. Are you ready to begin? Hi. Hope you don't mind. It's my first time driving a car. Of course not. That's my job. I teach people like you how to become a safe and responsible driver. So let's begin. Remember, the most important rule of driving. Safety first. There are some steps to follow. First, you should put on your seatbelt. You should always remember to do that. In case of an accident or emergency, having a seatbelt on is of utmost importance. OK, I have my seatbelt on. Now what should I do? Start the car. Good. Now make sure that the steering wheel is in the proper position and that your seat is not too far or not too close to the pedals. I'm all ready to go. Should I shift into first gear? Don't forget to put the parking brake down. You don't want to drive with that up. Oh yeah, I almost forgot. If I have the parking brake on, I won't be able to accelerate. Yes, that's right. Now put the car in reverse and slowly back out of the parking space. Good. Put the car in first gear. When should I shift? Is it better to shift slowly or quickly? You can shift whenever you feel is appropriate. This means shifting should occur smoothly. Do not shift too slowly or you will stall. Shifting too fast will waste gas. Shifting is simple. Just remember to shift smoothly. To shift, you will have to push the clutch and then push the gas pedal. Before the broadcast continues, look at questions 15 to 20. You will now listen to the second part of the talk. Remember, smoothly is the key to good shifting. Like this? Yes, that's good. Now keep it slow. Don't drive very fast just yet. Be sure to constantly check your mirrors for oncoming traffic. Always be aware of everything that is around you, including three important things. Remember these three. People crossing the streets, other cars, and bicycles riding next to you. What should I do if I see a yellow light? Well, it's always better to brake instead of trying to run it. But if you're travelling at a speed where it's impossible to stop in time, then you should try to make it across the intersection. But remember, you should always try to stop. It's the safest way to avoid an accident. Even if I have to brake very suddenly? Yes, even if you have to brake suddenly. What about if a driver behind me is going a lot faster than I am? You should always be ready to move to a slower lane if a driver behind you is forcing you to go faster than you are comfortable with. Never try to speed up to accommodate a faster driver. You could risk an accident or a speeding ticket. It's better to let him go. That sounds like good advice. Be careful. There is a sharp turn up ahead. Remember to brake before turns. Otherwise, you might flip over if your speed is too high going into a turn. Got it. I know that I should always try to observe all traffic safety. That's right. 
if safety is not your first priority, it will make driving very dangerous for you and other drivers on the road. OK, park the car here. You did a great job today for your first day. I'll see you in three days. Thanks so much. I will see you then. That is the end of part two. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now turns to part three. Part three. You will hear a conversation between a student, Kayana, and a professor about an assignment. First, you have some time to look at questions 21 to 27. Now listen carefully and answer questions 21 to 27. Hi, Dr. Reed. Are you busy right now? Do you mind if I come in for a second? Hey, Kiana. No, I don't mind at all. Thanks. I just wanted to say that I'm enjoying your Urban Studies course and that I'm having some trouble with the first assignment. OK, no problem. What do you want to ask? This is my first time writing a paper of this length. All right. What sort of trouble are you running into? Well, writing more than 10 pages is actually turning out to be quite a task. I've been rereading some of the material, and I'm just not sure how to approach the assignment. Yes, it takes some time to get used to academic writing assignments. More time than I expected, really. I also want to do a really good job on the assignment. I don't want to put a half-hearted effort into it. I'm glad to hear that. I'll say that these assignments get easier to manage as time goes on. That's a small relief. I mean, it gets easier to plan the assignment and to organize one's time, but it still takes hard work and a sincere effort to produce a good piece of academic writing. My role is to guide you to the readings I think are the most relevant and to give you tips on managing your time. OK. Could we talk about the readings then? Sure. We can go over them. I guess I want to ask about the Cole House text first. It seems like a pretty interesting book. But sometimes a bit over the top, no? I would recommend reading just the first part of the book. It's the most relevant to the assignment that I gave you. The rest of the text goes on about a topic we will cover later in the semester. All right. I'll just read the intro then. As for the Peely article, oh, did you read that one? Yes, I accessed it online and then printed it out. OK. I would recommend you review that again. Also, remember what I said about the Liebskid article? I think you told the class to focus on the research methods, right? Yes. She approaches the problem in an innovative way. Let's see. For the Gary article, I think you should... Let me see. I think it would be best for you to read just the conclusion. Just the conclusion. I see. Yes. I would ask you to read the whole thing, but this way would be more efficient. Speaking of which, you should not bother reading the Wolfson article. Yeah, it didn't seem particularly relevant to the topic. Let's see. Any other reading you wanted to talk about? Let me see. Um, yes, the Cudler article. What do you think of that one? Ah, yes. How could I forget? That one is pretty central to the topic. I really think you must go over it again. Before you hear the rest of the conversation, you have some time to look at questions 28 to 30.
Now listen and answer questions 28 to 30. All right. Is there anything else you wanted to ask about? Yes, I wanted to ask about the line graph that you provided. It seems that the legend identifying the different parts is not there. Ah, it must not have been photocopied correctly. Here, let me explain them. They all represent percentages of the population in Manassas, OK? Line 1 here at the top is the percentage of people who were born in a foreign country. Born outside the country. OK, and this one? The next line down, line 2 refers to the percentage of people with citizenship. All right, got it. Those making a middle-class wage are represented by the fifth line down. OK, middle-class wage earners. And the line number 4? That is the percentage of people with a college education or higher. All right. And the one in the middle? That one is the percentage of population who are married and have children. Got it. Thank you so much, Dr. Reed. I really appreciate your help. That is the end of part three. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now it turns to part four. Part four. You will hear part of a lecture on cities of the future. You now have 30 seconds to read questions 31 to 37. OK, we've been looking at how societies will develop in the future and at the increase in the size of cities. So I want to talk to you today about the key considerations in these cities of the future. There are three key elements I want to look at, and these are the new features they will have, issues of size, and the main problems to be considered. First of all, individual transportation will be a big factor in these new megacities as public transport becomes unmanageable. There'll be a huge rise in the use of segways, which are personal transporters, like motorised scooters. As a result, and partly also to reduce pollution, roads will be altered so that they are narrower and will take up less of a city's space than they do currently. Naturally, this is a major change to the infrastructure, and something that may hinder it is the huge amount of investment it will require. The next thing is, what is going to happen to the commercial areas? We do not want these to become even larger concrete jungles than they are at present, so we have to look at design. And current designs for city development include building gardens on the roofs of these buildings, to make a more pleasant environment for workers. And you may think that these areas will expand to cope with increased commercial activity. In fact, the prediction is that they will cover one-fifth of the area that they do at present as we build upwards. The exception to this is shopping centres, which we predict will expand with more and more temperature-controlled malls. What may cause difficulties is that the superstores will be confined to the outer edges of the city as they will be too big to fit into the new malls. Then, of course, there are the residential areas and these will undergo their own changes. One particular development will be houses which are built from glass as innovations in this material allow it to provide light 
without causing problems with temperature inside a building. The residential areas will not be allowed to expand without limit, as happens in some areas at present, and their size will be restricted to a population of 15,000. One issue, which has yet to be resolved, and I'm not sure it ever will be, is how we manage to house older residents. They will be increasing in numbers as time goes on. Finally, how will these cities live? We know we have limited energy sources, so what will we do? Well, something currently in development, which will be a feature, is that waste is going to become an energy source. For example, to provide gas in homes. Also, as new technology and systems are developed, we will find that energy plants will become smaller. Another energy source we could use, but one which raises issues of having enough space and too much noise, is wind farms. Because of the problems, I'm not convinced these will be the grand solution to our energy problems that we thought they were going to be. You now have 15 seconds to read questions 38 to 40. Now, moving on to looking at the social aspect of cities, we need to look at housing and how people will live. Cities currently have flats in the centre, populated by single people and wealthier residents, and families tend to move to the outskirts. In the future, the centre of cities will see a dramatic change. We will see many more examples of cooperative buildings. This is where people join together to form a company that owns the building they live in. And despite continuing shortages, there will also be a rise in the provision of retirement homes in city centres so that the elderly can have easy access to hospitals and shops. Recently, we have seen a levelling off in the growth of private housing, and I think that will not change. But we are likely to see more social housing, as far fewer people will be able to afford to own their own homes. OK, now, if anybody has... Any that is the end of part four. Check your answers.